Hi, I'm Robert Tolpe, and today I'm talking about transgender women competing in women's sports. Considering the immense biological advantages that those assigned male at birth have over those assigned female at birth before they undergo hormone replacement therapy, and how little data we have on hormone replacement therapy's effects on performance in elite sports, I think people need to look beyond the metaphysics of gender identity and have a serious ethical discussion about this topic without being transphobic. So let's have one, shall we? In light of the first openly transgender athlete competing in this year's Olympic Games, I would like to talk about this topic because I've seen so many people fall down the rabbit hole of endless discussion of whether trans women are women or not, which people think is apparently up for debate for some reason. Most proponents of trans women competing in women's sports argue as follows. Trans women are women. Women belong in women's sports. Therefore, trans women belong in women's sports. And most opponents argue that trans women are men, actually, and men don't belong in women's sports, so trans women don't belong in women's sports. The problem with these arguments is that they seemingly ignore that men's and women's categories in sports only exist to account for average physiological differences between cisgender males and cisgender females, which gives cis males an advantage over cis females in competitive sports. Hence, this is a discussion regarding the biological advantage that being of a certain sex grants you, and the fact that trans women are women has little to do with biology and a lot more to do with psychology and sociology. So, because the categories were created to account for biology, someone of any gender could play in whatever gender category they socially belong in, as long as the biological advantages that their sex assigned at birth gives them are accounted for. Because trans women are socially best suited to compete in women's sports, the question is whether the biological advantage they would have over cis women is accounted for by them medically transitioning, as in undergoing therapies that greatly alter their physiology. It is to be concluded, then, that the real debate is surrounding the question that, when it comes to trans women who transitioned after puberty, do the physiological changes resulting from hormone replacement therapy reduce the advantage their biology grants them over cis women to a tolerable degree? And to what degree are biological advantages in general tolerated in sports? The answer to that question may seem obvious, but I assure you, this question is a lot harder to answer than it sounds. The media paints a simplistic picture of the ethics of trans women competing in women's sports. Some outlets interview purported experts in the field of transgender sports medicine who are adamant that the advantages trans women have over cis women are inconsequential, while other outlets publish scathing opinion pieces citing peer-reviewed papers saying that women's sports as we know it will come to an end if trans women are allowed to compete. I've surmised that the only way to unpack the great deal of nonsense we see in headlines is to start with the facts. It is a well-established fact that cisgender males, on average, have a significant advantage in sports over cisgender females. This is because, on average, cis males are bigger and stronger than cis females, and have higher muscle mass primarily due to higher levels of testosterone. But what about trans women, who are assigned male at birth but undergo hormone replacement therapy? It is widely documented that muscle mass and testosterone levels are significantly reduced by hormone replacement therapy. But is that reduction in muscle mass enough to overcome the competitive advantages trans women would otherwise have over cis women in sports? From this question onwards, the indisputable facts run thin. Some researchers like Dr. Joanna Harper and her colleagues have conducted studies that indicate that this reduction in muscle mass in as little as 12 months into a trans woman's transition may be sufficient enough to overcome most of the advantages she would have in sports like running, for instance. But they are clear that more research is needed. Other researchers, like Dr. Emma Hilton and her colleagues, have pointed out that hormone replacement therapy only does so much. They claim that for the vast majority of sports, especially those involving strength, the reductions in muscle mass aren't sufficient enough to overcome the advantage trans women have over cis women. They point to the fact that a trans woman's heart, lungs, and bones are all on average significantly larger than a cis woman's, and hormone replacement therapy does not change the size of those organs at all. 
This means that trans women, despite years of hormone replacement therapy, would still have a larger heart to pump blood more efficiently, larger lungs to more effectively oxygenate the blood, and more bone surface area to develop musculature on when compared to cisgender women. According to Hilton and her colleagues, this fact would mean a significant advantage for trans women. But Harper explains that it's not that simple. Having dense bones and large organs might actually hinder performance if you don't have the muscle mass to move them around. It would be akin to putting the engine of a Toyota Prius in a Ford F-150. Just because the truck is big doesn't mean it would drive well because it would be so underpowered. So what is the right answer? Surely there is one considering so many people are so confident that trans women have an advantage over cis women and that this statement is a fact. Well, to say that something is a fact, you have to have strong evidence to support it, otherwise it's nothing more than an educated guess. And currently, as of 2021, there are no controlled longitudinal studies that measure the effects of hormone replacement therapy on performance in elite sports. That's right, not a single study. We only have Dr. Joanna Harper's study, which wasn't controlled, and that study indicated that, at least for running, the performance gap between trans women and cis women closes almost completely. Considering that study's results point to a conclusion completely opposite to what so many researchers in the field are saying, I wonder what is actually informing other researchers' strong stances on this topic. Dr. Hilton and her co-author, Dr. Tommy Lundberg, admit in their peer-reviewed systematic review of the zero longitudinal studies of the performance of trans athletes undergoing hormone replacement therapy, that the relevant data on this topic are practically non-existent. And they even admit that they can only make, and I quote, strong inferences about possible unfairnesses that may or may not exist when trans women compete against cis women. Last time I checked, an inference, even a strong inference of an expert in the field, is, is still not a fact. It's just a very educated guess. So I wonder why Emma Hilton, one of the authors of the paper, claims this paper supports that an unfairness exists. Anna said that uh, if Hubbard was allowed to compete, it would be unfair on women and quotes like a bad joke. So your research basically backs up Anna Van Bellingen, right? Yes, I think that there is a, a fairness deficit here. If that sentiment is not coming from the paper or pertinent data, where is this assertion coming from? Now, this is where I begin to question Dr. Hilton's attitude towards transgender people. I notice she has had a few choice words to say about transgender people in the past. So let's take a look at her Twitter, shall we? First of all, followed by JK Rowling. We're, we're, we're off to a great start here. Okay, just because she's followed by a TERF or a trans-exclusionary radical feminist doesn't mean she's a TERF, right? Right? Hmm, what's this? Linking a book review for a book called Irreversible Damage, The Transgender Craze Seducing Our Daughters by uh, someone named Abigail Shire. Wait. <laughs> Isn't that like the turf Bible or something? Anyways, I'm sure the review that Dr. Hilton reposted is a scathing criticism of the book, right? Right? Well, I read the review and it said the book was important and that the author brings up some alarming facts that desperately need to be looked into. Oh dear, it's not looking good for Dr. Emma Hilton now, is it? But this could be an anomaly. She didn't actually say anything about the book, did she? Maybe she's just interested in hideously transphobic books. Let's look at what else she has to say about transgender people. This tweet is in response to a threat about transgender women in women's bathrooms. Okay, Emma is explaining how it's really hard for her to sift out dangerous perverts from trans women, stating that we can't tell which men are trans and which men are not. And that the more they push for total capitulation of women to accept blatantly beardy dudes in their bathrooms, the more they betray nice trans women. Okay then. This is a mask off moment for Dr. Emma Hilton. She says she's all for the inclusion of trans women, all while tweeting that trans women are beardy dudes barely distinguishable from male predators. So it seems like, at least in her case, that there's a great deal of prejudice against trans women, influencing her strong inference about whether or not there is an unfairness when trans women compete against cis women. 
This shows us that we have to evaluate the extent to which transphobia plays a role in people's opinions about this topic. This doesn't mean, however, that we should attack everyone who makes this inference for being transphobic. It just means that we have to be cognizant of transphobia when thinking about this. We've so far established that because the data are so scant on this topic, it's impossible to make a definitive statement whether or not a significant unfairness is present when trans women compete against cis women. But because there's little data, this leaves many possibilities open. Trans women could either have very minimal or no advantage over cis women, or an advantage large enough that we would have to take it into consideration. So we have to evaluate both of these scenarios when talking about this topic. First up is thinking critically about the implications of a hypothetical large unfairness that may or may not exist when trans women compete against cis women. In sports, we understand that there will always be a degree of unfairness present, so we have no choice but to tolerate certain unfairnesses. We tolerate unfairnesses that some cis women are genetically stronger, taller, have higher levels of testosterone, and higher muscle mass. We do not tolerate, however, the unfairness of a cis male competing against a cis female, which is why we have separate men's and women's categories to eliminate this unfairness. So why is it that a lot of people would not tolerate the hypothetical presence of an unfairness when trans women compete against cis women in certain sports, but actively tolerate other unfairnesses? Is there a logical reason for not tolerating this unfairness over others, or is it just transphobia? There are few logical reasons that I can think of for why the alleged unfairness of trans women competing against cis women would be considered an especially intolerable unfairness as far as biological unfairnesses go. For instance, there are cis women who have conditions that greatly increase their testosterone production, and cis men, for that matter, with genetic mutations that allow their blood to carry more oxygen than normal. This is when you often hear the argument, if we can tolerate the unfairness of Michael Phelps existing in competitive swimming, considering his DNA is probably 14% fish or something, then why can't we tolerate the potential unfairness of trans women competing in certain sports against cis women? The problem with the argument that the statement comes along with, that biological unfairnesses already exist in sports, so why can't we just ignore X biological unfairness, is that you could use that argument to justify the presence of a biological unfairness of any kind being present in sports, no matter the magnitude of the unfairness. My grown self could compete in a youth basketball tournament, and after dunking on all the kids, I could proclaim that the biological unfairnesses of me being of a certain age should be ignored because biological unfairnesses already exist in sports and are just a fact of life. But obviously, it's clear that this biological unfairness can't be tolerated. This begs the question, which biological unfairnesses are tolerable and which are not. The current International Olympic Committee guidelines allow for trans women to have a maximum testosterone level that is more than five times higher than the upper range of your average cis woman's testosterone level. Some would argue that testosterone improves athletic performance across the board, and for this reason, higher testosterone is often considered an all-purpose benefit. A cis woman couldn't attain testosterone levels five times greater than the upper range for an average cis woman without using performance-enhancing substances, which they cannot do under current policies, and is therefore denied an all-purpose benefit that trans women have. Therefore, you could argue that this is what makes trans women's participation in women's sports an intolerable unfairness. This is approximately the argument made by Andrea Bianchi in her paper, Transgender Women in Sports. However, I think there is way less thinking involved in how we classify whether a biological unfairness is intolerable or not. Usually, the tolerability of most unfairnesses is gauged by the magnitude of how unfair they are. For instance, the heavier weight of a winner in a wrestling match is considered to be a tolerable unfairness if they're one pound heavier than their opponent, but considered to be an intolerable unfairness if they are 18 pounds heavier. This is why there are separate weight classes to mitigate this unfairness such that it reaches tolerable levels. Thus, by these principles by which we currently determine whether an unfairness is tolerable or not, if the unfairness of a trans woman competing against a cis woman in a given sport is akin to the magnitude of the unfairness present when, for instance, wrestlers of different weight classes compete against each other, and said unfairness stems from an advantage granted to trans women by an all-purpose benefit that cis women do not have access to, we can conclude that this unfairness would be intolerable, assuming an unfairness meeting these criteria exists in the first place. But the problem with those criteria that deem an unfairness intolerable 
is that they are arbitrary because you can't logically determine which unfairnesses are tolerable or not and can only somewhat determine which ones are more tolerable than others, the only logical thing you can do is eliminate every unfairness that is large enough to be eliminated. Some claim this can be done by creating an advanced data-backed algorithm that deducts someone's biological advantages over others from their score, such that their score would measure skill only. But practically, that is nearly impossible to do. A system like that also makes a large assumption, namely that biological advantages are unfair and that their effects should be eliminated in the first place. In sports as we understand them now, we praise and celebrate someone's biological advantages just as much as we praise their willpower and determination. As a consequence of all these factors, even if we knew definitively that trans women had a large advantage when competing against cis women, it would be harder than you'd immediately think to gauge whether that advantage should be considered an unfairness in the first place. Now that we've thought critically about the scenario where the presence of a significant advantage that trans women allegedly have over cis women is confirmed, what if there is no significant advantage present in many sports and the guidelines put in place by the International Olympic Committee are in fact sufficient to mitigate any advantage there would be otherwise? It would be a no-brainer to let trans women compete in women's sports because the only reason the category exists in the first place is to eliminate the advantage that cis males have over cis females. And if a comparable advantage is nowhere to be found between trans women and cis women, then they should compete in the category they feel most comfortable competing in and, socially speaking, belong in. But because we cannot outrule the presence of this theorized advantage with the data we currently have, there's the looming question of what we are to do right at this moment. Because the current International Olympic Committee guidelines for testosterone levels and minimum amount of time specified for undergoing hormone replacement therapy are based off of the same non-existent data that can't definitively tell us that trans women have no significant competitive advantage at any point in their transition, let alone at just 12 months into their transition, we have to address the very real possibility that these guidelines may accomplish little to nothing at all. That 12-month treatment duration requirement and 10 nanomoles per liter maximum testosterone level could be replaced with testosterone levels and treatment durations picked out of a hat, and there would be an uncomfortably high chance that those numbers picked out of a hat would be measurably more effective than the ones in use now. Proceeding with an abundance of caution not present at this moment would be in order when setting guidelines like these, as any decision made now could have devastating consequences for trans athletes who, because of decisions made on a lack of data today, could either be unfairly excluded from competitions they belong in because they didn't meet ill-informed requirements, or they could be stripped of their medals years from now because the current guidelines might be found insufficient to mitigate some intolerable unfairness that could be discovered. Speaking of intolerable unfairnesses, it's also important to discuss what biological unfairnesses mean to sports, and which ones we should tolerate, and which ones we should not, and whether our decision to tolerate some unfairnesses over others is based on reason or bigotry. I understand that this video probably leaves many with more questions than answers, and instead of that being a bad thing, I say it is, in fact, a good thing. Someone having doubts about their viewpoints on a topic will hopefully stop them from confidently saying something that is demonstrably false. Anyways, I'm Robert Tolpe, and I hope you enjoyed this video, and if you did, don't forget to like, comment, share, and subscribe, maybe even hit that bell, and check out my Patreon linked below on your way out, and I hope you have a wonderful day. Bye-bye!